Danger Dolan. I know based on the video's title that you might have some strong feelings towards this issue, so I feel it'd be prudent to pull the strings on my emotion bow and hit you with a trank shot. We're going to discuss whether or not WoW is indeed dying, or if it's still going as strong as it's ever been. And to start with, we're going to define the word dying in the case of MMOs. Since the subscriber count is the only way in which we can identify their success, I'll be using them as the prime example. And as before, I'll be giving my uh, a monologue of thoughts, and then I'll be turning to some community comments and discussing those. So if you want to jump straight to those, have a look at the timeline below this video and go straight there. But let's get on with it. We all use the word dying because it has more impact than, say, dwindling. For me, using the term WoW is dying, that is contradictory to the fact that it's the healthiest MMO out there. At the time of this video, WoW has 8 million subscribers. To put that into perspective, if you take all the other big MMORPGs, combine their player base, and competed them against WoWs, it'd be roughly equal. And those games are free to play. Is the game dying when the subscribers start dropping off, or is it when they are nearing non-existence? Do we measure a game's life by its current subscribers and the changes it has? Just because a game only has a thousand subscribers and the numbers fell by 20 this year. Does that make a dying game on a level of WoW, or is this a separate kind of dying? As you can see by this graph here, there has never been a steep drop in the history of WoW. When there's a market crash on Wall Street, the prices don't ease off over the course of a few years. No, it crashes into the ground because something has gone horribly wrong. So please note that when I say the word dying, I do mean dwindling, and yes, the game has been dwindling since early Cataclysm. The latest subscriber loss was 1.8 million, which is nothing to sneeze at, alright? That's the amount some games live off, and it vanished within months. It's important to bear in mind though that World of Warcraft is a worldwide game. In places like China, currently overrun by a recent wave of free-to-play games, a subscription-based game like Warcraft cannot compete. The mindset is, who cares if the game is crap, this other game is free, developed and maintained in my country. Mind you, not all the lost subscribers came from Asian regions, but still a good deal of them. On the other hand, I can attest to the fact that Oceanic Realms have been getting abandoned left, right and centre, though for different reasons. It has to do with their cost, the game's age, our own age in the eight years gone by, and the general lack of interest now that Azeroth's evolution has become routine. It's difficult to get excited when a lot of the experience is coated in the same aged hotkey based combat, along with the go kill and collect quests. When you look through the comments in the WoW community, you can get a sense of what it is that push people to subscribe. Sure they might have gotten tired of the game or little things add up that frustrate them, but what is the key factor that pushes them over the edge? As a general sweeping feeling, most people don't find WoW challenging anymore, thanks to the easy mode type features that gear up newer players so they can stay competitive in endgame. This is in main part due to LFR and welfare loot offered by Valor Points. The former a problem this expansion, and the latter which has been around since BC. The PvP community feels that because of class compositions and CC abilities taking priority over skill, it's easy to feel cheated out of a win simply because the class you're fighting has an unfair advantage due to CC imbalance, cough paladins cough. To be fair, this has been the case for a while now. And aside from removing CC and suns completely, it's a bit difficult to fix. The raiding community states again and again they unsub simply because they're tired of doing the same content over and over again, LFR being that prime culprit. The excitement of reaching the new mysterious boss is now gone because you can just see it on easy mode with gear drops. With no alternative progression to raiding, the drive to excel diminishes and people stop playing, thereby causing a chain reaction that makes legitimate progression guilds find it harder to find people to recruit, thus causing even more people to leave because nobody can find a stable team to progress with. It's a horrible cycle, and one I personally feel is responsible for the majority of the sub drop. For the average casual player or newcomer to WoW, it's hard for them to join the game now since the community doesn't care about them much anymore. Unlike in Vanilla, BC, or even Wrath, it's now expected you have an intricate knowledge of the game to progress at level cap. People don't care to explain anything anymore because there's too much to learn and explain. You gotta get good or go home. Sometimes I see in the forums people saying it takes too long to level up for the average player these days. 
a male usually in his mid-twenties with a considerable amount more responsibilities than when he was younger. I flat out don't agree with this, as Endgame should be a reward for those committed enough to get there. What I do agree with though, is that it takes too long to gear up for normal mode raiding. Back in Cataclysm, it was possible to grind an endless amount of heroics wearing tabards, do the daily every day for Valor, and buy the gear you needed to get into raiding. Sure, it got a bit overboard with the same eye level from rep factions as that in normal mode raiding itself, but it's more the fact that you could grind your way into normal mode raids as fast as you wanted. No artificial gating preventing you from reaching a higher eye level until the server reset. Just like leveling in which you can grind to level 19 one week if you try really hard, you should be able to be good enough for a raid team in the same span of time. Why should I put in a month of gearing just to do the same raid I've been doing in LFR but on a harder difficulty? That seems like a punishment to me. I'm not aiming for new content, I'm not able to play at my own pace, and I'm not in a guild at the start of a patch or an expansion. I'm essentially boned because everyone is out gearing me. I fail to see the incentive, and I know some of you might want to just clear hard mode with the gear, and that's your suitable reward, right? But I've always played to fight new bosses, and that desire is now gone. Maybe a lot of people feel the same way, maybe they don't, but it's how I feel. But aside from all this, the reason I truly believe WoW is starting to decline in numbers is purely that it's aging. The truth is that if WoW were to release today with all the content improvements it has now, and no other MMOs on the market just like it had back in 2004, it'd be a huge success. But it hasn't been released today, it was released 8 years ago. That a single video game could make it this long is an achievement in itself, and well deserved when you think about how much work went into the expansions. The truth is, this game, like any older human being, likely has less days ahead than behind. But that doesn't make it dying, just like a healthy 50 year old man isn't dying. That's just the natural order of things. You are born or created, you have a surge of life when people discover you, you reach a peak in your life, then you have a steady, slow decline with brief surges upwards until you no longer exist. This doesn't apply to Blizzard, of course, who in this example would represent God, but WoW is created with a lifespan. We're now in the period of decline. It's actually spooky how closely related WoW's lifespan could be linked to a living, breathing thing. So before it dies, it needs a successor, currently known as Titan, to take over, just like a person needs to have children. Essentially the same genre known as the MMO, but like the genes passed on from parent to child, the same life continued in a completely new way. The only reason WoW can't live forever is because of us, the players. We want something new, but also the same, but not the same. We want innovation alongside familiarity. And that is why WoW is dwindling. Not because of the game or the developers, but because of us. Anyway, those are my thoughts on the topic. Now let's turn to some community comments, starting with TimmyTime980. I don't feel like WoW is dying anytime soon, but if Blizzard want to keep WoW alive, they need to close about half of the servers. Then make LFR just give Valor and Gold, and maybe even only have LFR raids after the new patch. Then non-raiders get to see the content, and the heroic raiders will get the amazing feeling of beating a raid again and seeing a boss for the first time. What are your thoughts on this? Well, as I'm sure a lot of people will point out, some servers are almost entirely barren. However, you have to bear in mind that virtual realms will almost, if not entirely, solve this problem by merging certain servers together. Although there hasn't been much information on what servers or how many will be merged, I'd hold off blaming servers on whether or not WoW is dying until after patch 5.4 hits. That's pretty much the reason I haven't moved off Dathomir yet, which is clearly dying, because I know the mergers will repopulate it without the need to spend money. Now about releasing LFR sections after the current patch, I both agree and disagree. I do my very best in these discussions never to play devil's advocate, which means if I think something is a good idea, I'll say so, if something sounds bad, I'll say it's bad but I won't needlessly argue against a point I personally agree with. I agree in that releasing an LFR section three months after it comes out would benefit the game in a huge number of ways. The desire to progress returns. The only way to see content is to join a guild and raid on a difficulty that requires a functioning brainstem. This is good. People who want to see the raid but can't commit to a team don't have to wait until the next expansion to solo it. Now it opens up during one of the in-between patches currently numbered 5.1 landfall and 5.3 escalation. I love this idea, and the positives outweigh the negatives. Of course, if this were to happen, 
they would need to keep gear drops, otherwise the change wouldn't go down so well. Alternatively, you could give the gear drops to a more difficult heroic dungeon and the scenarios, and then just cut out LFR drops altogether. However, I disagree with the idea in that people are now expecting of LFR for their raiding experience. Just like flying mounts, you don't take LFR gear drops or the low difficulty curve away from people. You have to gradually ease people back into the longer delay between patch release and LFR sections. Not sharply take it away from them or you just risk Cataclysm Heroic Dungeons disaster. LFR babies, just like real babies, don't like having their shiny toy taken away. In all honesty, I'm disappointed that Blizzard backed themselves into this corner in the first place. I could tell from the very first Dragon Soul LFR what was going to happen, and here we are. You can't remove LFR without subscriber loss. You can't keep LFR in its current form because it's removing long-term interest in the game. You can't even change it because the forums would explode. Anyway. Next comment from Liam Kelly. I think WoW is everything but dying. Sure, a ton of people really didn't really like pandas or panda land at all. And sure, LFR really does hurt PvE a ton. I think will the next patch, Siege of Orgrimmar, and everything we've been told so far by Rathion, WoW is taking a turn for the better. Well, first up, as much as I dump on Mists being a filler expansion, and then there's the people who compare the announcement to Kung Fu Panda, I don't necessarily have anything against Pandas or Pandaria. I just don't believe turning them into an entire expansion was a smart idea. That's like how, instead of making Cataclysm, the expansion were to focus on Gilneas and their culture, with occasional patches jumping between other parts of Azeroth. Pandaria should have been one part of an expansion with a bigger scope, like the South Seas. Blizzard have even admitted themselves that they didn't seriously consider Mists as an expansion until they'd already started work on Cataclysm. It's impressive they managed to create all this new story in such a short span of time, but with so many other options on the plate, Cough, Emerald, Dream, Cough, it leaves me wondering why they bothered trying. According to Liam's comment, the next patch proves that WoW is taking a turn for the better. It's a shame he didn't specify why, but I can deduce he means from the new features, flexible raids, virtual realms, proving grounds, the timeless isle, and of course the new Siege of Orgrimmar raid. I'll admit, these are improvements long overdue, the proving ground, timeless isle, and new raid not so much, but flexible raids are an amazing idea to harken back to the wrath days of clearable 10 mans. I'm praying they don't go overboard with the difficulty one way or the other, but I'm imagining casual guilds will be able to ideally clear them in a matter of weeks, possibly months. Virtual realms are the real godsend though. A lot of people underestimate how much is going to change the game come the next patch, although they have said that it's going to take a while for the numbers to climb, so don't expect it to be instant. No matter what realm you choose though, you'll find tons of people, just like the populated US realms. If you mix all the oceanic realms together, perhaps, maybe, there's a chance that, given all the moons align and the wheels stop on the right number, that you might see other players walking around from time to time. Will these two additions bring back all the subscribers lost since the launch of Mists? No, but they'll help convince existing players to stick around. You're going to see an influx of new raiders and progression guilds with entry level flexible mode as the new puggable raid of choice. If it weren't for LFR, would see even more people aiming for normal mode, but you can't have everything, I guess. Next comment from T Source1015. Well, the question is WoW well, dying is very hard to answer. If you are on oceanic servers like us, our servers are slowly dying. Servers like mine, Gundrak, is already close to dying. WoW well, has had a lot of population jobs ever since Kata. It got much easier by adding LFR. The one thing that made WoW well way too easy was the heirloom armor and the RAF experience boosts. The one thing that made WoW better was returning Arthas, so if they bring back someone else like Arthas, maybe it will be better, but we don't know. So first up, I agree about the Oceanic servers, hopefully fixed soon. Not sure LFR has been helping the situation since, even though Blizzard claim the mostly comprised of people who don't ordinarily raid, <laughs> bullshit! It's more the fact that when you run LFR over and over for gear, the drive to see bosses and other difficulties deteriorates as well as completely removes the thrill of discovering a new boss. As for the heirloom and experience boosts, did they help perpetrate the subscriber loss? I wouldn't be so sure of that. Maybe if they'd introduced them in vanilla or BC, but in Wrath you could only get experience boosts from the chest and shoulders for a total of 20%. 
it's only in Cataclysm that it shot up to like 50, which caused a few problems with the new leveling content. Ideally, Blizzard should have left them for Mr. Pandaria, but it is nice that you can be level capped and grind either a lot of dungeons or a lot of battlegrounds to get a full set, which means newbies won't blaze through the content unlike veterans. If Blizzard were to give every player heirlooms in day one, it'd be terrible. But they don't, so it isn't. The argument you don't have to wear them seems ludicrous to me, since slowing down your own progress feels counterproductive. I'm sure a lot of people feel otherwise, but 8 years on from release, I'd rather level faster these days than draw things out and savor the revamped content. So overall, I like how LMs are implemented, of course I do wish they'd let you turn off the experience bonuses while keeping the scalable stats, be kind of everything. T-Source's last comment about bringing someone like Arthur's back into the game, to be perfectly honest, I don't think they can do it with their current game. The difference between a story in an RTS like Warcraft 3 and an MMO like WoW, it's important to note. In Warcraft 3, you control a hero, not a random adventurer. You experience a single story, a campaign, first-hand, only you, with cutscenes after every mission. In WoW, there are many, many stories, and the game is designed from the ground up to be a multiplayer experience. And from everything I've seen in multiplayer games, the one solid truth is People don't care about story, not unless it removes your chat box, removes your ability to jump around while a character is talking. It's the difference between playing a game while someone talks about random shit in the background and you can't concentrate, or turning your chair and listening to them talk about that random shit. An RTS will make me turn around and listen. MMOs, I just want to see existing story and characters do stuff while I fight bosses, but I don't want Massive story revelations when I'm surrounded by 15 mobs on Ventrilo yelling at the heel at a pop trank. And that is why we can't have someone like Arthas again. That's why I recommend Blizzard makes a Warcraft 4 RTS base a new MMO engine on that. It will sell like hotcakes covered in naked women. Now here's a comment from Titans Blues. WoW is dying because the community has gone to shits. You can't get into a LFR, even though LFR is the only way to catch up with alts, and I hate it a lot, agreed, is that a player will be screaming saying, wow, stop pulling you noob tank, or just saying other gibberish, we don't want to hear this, so we scream at that, so it becomes a clusterfuck of bitching and whining, and in fact, I have not seen so much until this expansion came out, and when LFG and LFR looking for retards came out. Allow me to clear up the issue of community problems in WoW once and for all. You have LFG and LFR groups designed for randoms and casuals to see content without committing to guilds or socializing if they don't feel like it. Normal and heroic raids as well as challenge modes are for guilds and groups of friends. Blizzard can't force you to be social, alright? All they can do is incentivize the process of looking for a guild, since that is where you'll have the most fun. I do understand where Titans Blues is coming from, and if you give the player an option to clear an entire new raid without having to talk to anyone, uh, and it gives you gear, and there's no challenge whatsoever, chances are they'll pick that option. Now here's a tweet from Ghostcrawler, the lead system designer for WoW, on that subject. Alright, so he's talking about in terms of game health, at the top tier you got social groups, which is guilds, below that you have pugs, and then you got random matchmaking, you know, LFR, and they're not grouping at all. So that last bit is why LFR exists, otherwise people wouldn't do content. And I tend to agree with them. As much as LFR pollutes the community with randoms and trolls, at least people are seeing the whole raid now, which wasn't exactly common before Dragon Soul. Of course, I'd make a counterpoint arguing that opening LFR so soon after the patch with gear drops is a horrible decision, but that crab portrait is intimidating, and I don't want to wake up in the middle of the night with my esophagus clawed out. In the same bundle of tweets, he wonders if they could introduce hard heroic dungeons on the level of heroic scenarios or pre-made groups, to which I would yell a hearty yes. Nothing promotes realm and friend camaraderie like hard pre-made group content. You'll still find the same trolls and randoms in these if you pug, but what it does is encourage you to seek out a guild, a group of players you can work with to avoid chat spam and nooblets ruining your good time. If you have a clear and definite line between easy match made content for the casuals and hard pre-made stuff which offers greater rewards and experiences and possibly some exclusive content, it'll encourage positive community behavior. 
but we need the divergence, i.e. you don't gear up from normal mode through LFR since they're aimed at two different audiences. If I want to gear up through hard content, I should be offered that choice. Titans Blue's comment represents how a lot of players feel because if you want to gear for normal mode, you have to endure endless LFR runs to do so. It is, for me, a major reason why the game's player base is declining, because of this unclear line forcing players into the match-made gearing up process and then onto pre-made hard content when it should be one or the other. Well, yeah, there's alternatives where you could get a bunch of valor points and upgrade your gear or what have you, but when you can just get easy gear drops from LFR, that's all you're going to want to do. That's just how it is. And now here's a comment from Sabatoa79. If Blizzard would make WoW how they wanted it to be made and listen to constructive criticism, then I think WoW would never die. Sadly, they are trying to take every comment from elitist to casual and implementing it into the game. It's not working. Just let them do what they know how to do, and WoW will go on for a long, long time. Or at least till Titan is released. Truer words were never spoken. It's even worse when they introduce something ill-received, like mandatory daily quests, than a battalion of their developers actually argue with the people complaining on forums, only for them to silently back down and make dailies optional again. It's like, come on, stick to your guns, or keep dailies as they are. Or admit you were wrong, and fix it. Don't hang on both sides of the fence trying to tell us what we should enjoy in the game, while also pandering to the same schmoes who are yelling in your face. Likewise, when you try to please everyone with the same product, guess what? Everyone starts arguing over said product because the casuals get more accessible content than the elite, or the elite get more exclusive content than the casuals. Raiding as it stands is a perfect example of this. On paper, you have hardcore raiders with plenty of challenge, clearly raiders have always done on heroic mode, while the casuals get to experience the same content at their own pace. Right, so on paper, that works. But in reality, the magic of progression rating is gone because easy mode is shoved in your face and none of the casuals want to progress anymore, leaving semi-casual guilds in the dust. This is a side effect of compromise. When the game caters to two different parties, those in between are forced to choose a side. When Blizzard, like any parent stepping between a kid's fight, don't put their foot down and say, no, you'll both cooperate. It means the kids think they have all the power in that situation. In early Wrath, you had 10 men easy mode and 25 men hard mode. That was it. Either you strive to clear the content, which was actually achievable by casual guilds, or you never saw it. There was no LFR alternative. But now, every man and his dog can clear LFR without even rubbing two brain cells together, which pollutes all difficulties above that since the casuals now have all the power. If later this year, Blizzard were to announce the next expansion and say, we're moving back to the Wrath rating paradigm, there would be an uproar, an explosion on the forums, of course. But when a kid throws a tantrum, you don't take him out for ice cream, you stick to your guns. The problem is that when the kid is paying you, you're more inclined to submit to him. And that's why we can't have nice things. To summarize, pandering to all audiences pollutes the game's community, but it's not the direct cause of WoW's steady decline. Next comment from Wyant Naguyan. <laughs> hey Danger Dolan, did you notice since LFR, Trade Chat has lost posts for pugs? Do you think they should implement the LFR mechanic with letting players choose normal difficulty. I don't see why they wouldn't add the option already. Also I have an idea for Blizzard implementing a reward bonus just like in LFG, extra loot for tanks and heals, for raiding with a player the same week. The more players, the more loot, just with epic purple and more charms for bonus rolls. By the way, fuck a valor cap. Right, so when LFR was announced back near Dragon Soul, for a little while, we didn't know what it was. I was dearly hoping at the time that it would be exactly as you described, a supplement to traditional rating so that you could replace missing or bad members with players from cross realm zones. How disappointed I was when I joined a Dragon Soul LFR for the first time and realized how outrageously easy it was to clear. However, upon hearing about flexible raids, it's my belief that this is what LFR should have been in the first place. A less difficult, but not brain-dead easy, raid experience using cross-realm players. 
With this addition, we should safely be able to downplay LFR as a gearing mechanism and leave it optional, like dailies are today. Wyatt's comment about the reward system for raiding with the same plays each week, it's not bad, but like the current loot bags for tanks and healers and heroic dungeons incentivizing participation, I don't think it would influence the thing itself. Like, I don't queue in a certain role for a dungeon just because I get a neat bonus bag. I do it because I feel like it. Players will raid with each other if they feel like doing it, and won't if they don't. The flexible raids system of, hey, any new player you bring will make you fight the same boss again. That's a much bigger deterrent for bringing in new players than a bonus bag. Ideally, when you join a flexible raid, it puts you in a kind of temporary in-game guild type page with the other members that expires after a week. So, in this flexible guild type page, you can chat or update the team on your whereabouts just like you would a real guild. Then, when the Tuesday reset comes, it disbands your little page until you reform a new team and re -queue. This promotes camaraderie between that team without making you commit to anything or anyone past a week, unlike a guild. I don't know about you, but I like the prospect of forming a new team every week, working on a flexible raid wing, sticking with that team the following week, or, if I choose to, form a completely new one. It'd be like a temporary guild service for people drifting in and out of the game. As for Wyant's last point, the part where he says, fuck Valakap, I'd have to say, yes. Pelvic pound the Valor cap until it crumples and needs surgery. Indeed. Now here's a comment from Lax Goalie Seven Scar. WoW is stagnating, but definitely not dying. There's currently many positives in the game, with the patch release speed and raid boss complexity better than ever. There's also many things to do outside of raiding, like battle pets, whether you like them or not. Negatives: the main problem in MOP was the lack of classic lore and a clear end boss. Past expansion has had a clear end goal villain, and it felt natural the way Warcraft 3 lore fit together. Shah were a bunch of random shits that I didn't care about. Now I chose this comment to end the video on because I like when people phrase things both positively and negatively. It leads me to believe they're objective in nature, and not just ranting or worshipping something. So Lax Goalie says the game design and improvements are a definite highlight. Now that I can safely agree with. Anyone who claims WoW is dying because the devs abandoned it are completely out of their minds. More work has gone into patch features now than in the history of WoW. And on a personal note, I've been very impressed by their willingness to support fan sites like Gamebreaker, MMO Champion, WoWhead, Icy Veins, WoWpedia, YouTubers, Jesse Cox, WoW Crendor, Convert to Raid, and the Instance, just to name a few, by giving links on the official site offering interviews and answering questions. You can speak to them directly on Twitter if you so desire, or send an email or write on the forums. The game community, while dwindled in game, is more alive now than it's ever been simply because of how open the devs are. They listen to the players when they ask for things to do outside of raiding, they heard the outcry for more heroic dungeons and explain what was going on. Pretty much every feature in WoW has commentary now, including an individual raid bosses and the new expansion soundtrack. Introducing mini patches was probably the smartest thing they've ever done too. It means they have a team advancing story and keeping the players occupied while the main team works on the new raid tier and dungeons. I also agree with the negatives brought up. My whole issue with this expansion, aside from LFR polluting the community and the lack of heroic dungeons and, well, dailies before they fix them, has been the lore direction, which I've talked about several times before. The lack of boss directly feeds into that too. In theory, pitting the Horde versus Alliance is an ambitious idea, but then the expansion needs to focus on that. Instead, it's been split two ways. On one, you have Pandaria, the Shah left over from the Old God and the Thunder King. But on the other, you have mini patches focusing on Garrosh Hellscream and the problems he's caused in Azeroth, leading up to patch 5.4. Plain and simple, this wasn't a good idea. You could make an argument but that both storylines have been successfully merged, i.e. Alliance and Horde fighting over to be dominant on Pandaria, the Shah controlling Garrosh from behind the scenes, the Shadow Pan attempting to strike balance between uh, peace with two factions. But even in TV shows with multiple plot lines, there needs to be a connection. 
In soap operas, everything is set in the same small town between the same people. Whereas Mists is split between Pandaria and Azeroth, half focusing on the Pandas, half focusing on Alliance vs Horde. Imagine if in Burning Crusade, half the endgame content was set in Outland and half was set in Azeroth. Half the story about the Burning Crusade, the other half about Garrosh up to his old tricks again. You can't mishmash any two ideas together and expect them to work 100%, no matter how hard you try. I commend Blizzard for their attempt, but it never should have happened. Garrosh should have been handled in Cataclysm when it was appropriate. But the lore problems in Pandaya are not the reason it's losing subscribers or dying, if you would want to use that term. But I'm convinced it's why sales of the expansion when it was initially released, why they were a bit lousy. To go from 3.3 million sales for Cataclysm in the first day, to 2.7 million for Mists in the first week, that's not a promising start. If the lore can match current game design in terms of quality, the next expansion will indeed be the best one. I don't want to see WoW decline in subscribers, I fucking love this game and I have for 8 years now. Is WoW dying? Not a chance. Are its glory days over? Perhaps. So that's it, that's the whole topic discussed, we are moving on. Now for next week, the discussion topic I have in mind has to do with the Emerald Dream. So maybe not a lot of you know exactly what that is, but to give it, to give a summary, it's Azeroth before all the continents drifted apart. So Northrend, Eastern Kingdoms, Calum, they're all meshed together. Everything's green, there's a lot of evil, nightmarish stuff in there. It's a very, very interesting concept and it's been long in the making. Uh, there have been hints at Emerald Dream since the birth of WoW. Now, what I want to hear from you guys is what do you want to see in the expansion if it does come to light and whether or not you actually will see this expansion one way or the other. Or that it's going to completely ignore it and go on to other stuff like Argus or the South Seas. What is going to happen? I am currently reading the Storm Rage novel which has to do with the Emerald Dream. So I'll be able to talk about it a little bit in depth. But I'll see you all then, and have a good one.